I have the pleasure of introducing Camilla Benbow, the Pat Patricia and Rhodes Hard Dean of Education and Human Development here at Peabody. Dean Benbow created this series as a forum designed to host frank and open discussions about equity, diversity, and inclusion, which feels more important now than ever. And so um, we're really excited for this talk and to have you all join us and um, to have Dean Benbow introducing the latest speakers in the series. Welcome, Dean Benbow. Thank you. Oh, good evening and welcome to our second and final Dean's Diversity Lecture of the academic year. I want to note that we are holding this event only one day after the conviction of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. This has been a long year for many in our community, but I don't want to pretend it's a final resolution. We know that progress towards racial justice is slow, but we also know that it is inexorable. The Peabody administration is committed to pursuing justice and to supporting our black students, our ethnically diverse students, postdocs, faculty, and staff. So it is perhaps a lucky coincidence that tonight we celebrate the publication of a book about Nashville's historical march towards social justice. I'll take you there, exploring Nashville's social justice sites is a new work from the Vanderbilt University Press. And it represents an important contribution to our public understanding of Nashville history. I'll take you there is co-edited by Peabody alumni, alumna, sorry, Ami Thurber, assistant professor at Portland State University, and Dorotha Williams, Jr., Associate Professor of History at Tennessee State University. Dr. Williams is a scholar of African-American Civil War and Reconstruction and Public History. His courses explore the Civil War and Reconstruction, African-Americans and Public Memory, Black Politicians, Civil Rights, 20th Century Black Intellectuals, African Americans in Tennessee, and slavery and emancipation in Middle Tennessee. He also coordinates the North Nashville Heritage Project, which seeks to encourage a greater understanding of the history of North Nashville, including Jefferson Street and its relationship to greater Nashville community. He is on the board of directors of the Historic Nashville Foundation and serves on the Met Metro Historic Zoning Commission. Now, Dr. Thurber is a 2018 graduate of Peabody's Community Research and Action Program, who teaches in the School of Social Work at Portland State. Her scholarship focuses on building just neighborhoods. During her time in Nashville, she worked on equitable and affordable housing in Nashville's urban core and on tenant rights, including preparing a report for the Metropolitan Nashville Planning Department. Her dissertation, on the development and study of the Neighborhood Story Project, won the 2019 award for best dissertation by the Society for Community Research in Action. With support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, she continues to study issues of housing access in historical communities of color, displacement, and gentrification. In I'll Take You There, Thurber and Williams worked closely with more than 100 Nashvillians to collect stories and identify locations important to Nashville's social justice history. The work is a model multi-institutional and community-centered project that highlights the lived experiences and voices of Nashvillians. I'm excited to welcome them both this evening to discuss the evolution of this work and the deeper lessons it holds for us as citizens of Nashville. Thank you and welcome. Okay, um, thank you um, for having us this evening. evening. I'm deeply grateful um, to have the opportunity to first discuss our book at Vanderbilt. Um, I'm really excited to be with you to talk about this, this work, I'll take you there. Initially, we set out to create a different type of guidebook, um, both in terms of what the readers will be guided to see and experience, um, 
but also it want, we wanted to wanted to be different in terms of who was doing the guiding rather than signposting you know the the most well documented historical or um or, or uncritically emphasizing the things that draw people to Nashville. We wanted to um, explore these places, but also explore the contradictions that drew people here. And at the same time, pushed people out. We wanted to talk about Nashville or explore Nashville as a place that fostered um, social justice, social justice organizing, but also take a critical look at it as a place that reproduced um, deep social inequalities. We wanted to look at this place as a place where people experience the benefits of rapid economic growth. And by the same token, we also wanted to explore how this could be true but at the same time, you could have others that were living in areas where they had to survive off lower wages, where they faced the prospect of losing their homes. Um, we wanted to foreground the struggles and achievements of the movements toward social justice. That was our main focus. But perhaps most significantly, um, in place of giving you a guidebook that offered a single voice, or perhaps two voices, um, we wanted to give you an opportunity to experience the perspectives on the city with a multitude of voices. We wanted to intentionally privilege the perspectives of those most directly impacted by injustice in this city. Um, in many of my history courses at TSU, I employ, employ my students to focus on the history in the margins, focus on the people that society overlooks or ignores. And I think we have done this with this work. Um, but we had a lot of help. And some of you are sitting in the audience this evening. And I would like to offer my gracious thank you again. Um, um, hopefully, we'll be able to talk in, per in person. I can look in your eye and thank you. But for those of you who contributed, thank you very much. And, and, and this is. Um, your work. So we were supported by a diverse advisory committee and we set three broad criteria for our entries. And here's what we were looking for. Um, we wanted sites that challenged um, missing information or misinformation. We wanted sites that revealed privilege or dominance. And we also wanted sites that celebrated cultural resistance, resilience, and creativity. Um, we collected entries for more than three years for this project. And in some days it felt like 30 years, and I'm sure Dr. Thurber would agree on that. But what we did was we collected these entries and we solicited contributions from um, from the community through formal and informal networks. Um, this book's title reflects the spirit of this effort. Before there were guidebooks, there were just guides. The col colloquial use of um, I'll take you there has long been a response to the call of a stranger looking for recommendations of of where to go or what to do. And I can speak to that personally because um, when I first moved to Nashville, I didn't know anybody here, right? Um, so I hung out in the barbershop a lot and they would tell me about places to go and things to do. And it's like, man, I don't know anything about Nashville. And the most common response would be, 
but don't worry about it, Doc. I'll 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 take you there. So this this title is is the title of this work reflects a a spirit I think that is resident here in Nashville. As we discuss this book, you'll find that we had the help, we had the assistance of more than 100 Nashvillians. That is, this book includes entries from community organizers, neighborhood leaders, lay historians, local scholars, and college students. It is they who will take us there, guiding us to places we might not otherwise encounter. And as a result, this is truly a people's project grounded in the voices of the people of Nashville. So this evening, what we want you to do is to um, consider these stories and we want you to share with us as we journey through this work and, and, and um, listen intently as we share some of the stories as what into why we believe this book matters, why this book is needed and why it is important. And I think you will find that this is a significant final product and, and, and you will get an appreciation of the significance of the process. Um, let me tell you why I think it is important. Um, this book appealed to me as a historian who, um, I, was, I was trained to be an engaged historian and, and every job that I've I've had as an academic has required me to, to um, develop and cultivate intimate relationships with the people that I study. I'm a scholar of African American history and that was my first love, but the intersection of that love of African American history with public history meant that I had to get out in the public, right? I had to engage people on a personal level. And in order to do that successfully, I could not be a stranger. So it called for me to go to a lot of places such as churches and schools and engage in a really deep and profound manner with the people. So what I am saying to you is that um, as a scholar of African American history, as a historian, oftentimes certain voices are privileged, whereas other voices are marginalized. And once I realized that, I, I, I understood that I was missing a lot of the stories that, that would help analyze and interpret the history that I was studying. So the, when I explored these voices, when I listened to these voices, they animated the narrative in a way that all of the books that I read in grad school could not. So this work focuses on that. Um, what we've done in this work is we've engaged, we've called out, we've amplified voices that you might not associate with Nashville, but in voices I humbly submit to you that if we ignore, that we push to the side, if we mute these voices, um, Nashville would not be the Nashville that we recognize today. And in listening to these voices, um, they reveal something about the dominant narrative of Nashville. And, and, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's one of those things where, where cities oftentimes adopt a narrative that makes them comfortable, that makes them um, feel really good about themselves. I, I think it was Natasha Trethaway who very eloquently talked about us having having these 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 narratives that 
um, make us comfortable, but at the same time, they, they seduce us into a false identity of who we are. For example, some of these narratives might be familiar to you. For example, um, we started working on this really seriously when Nashville wore the crown as the it city, which is a, 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 a play on contradictions in and of itself if you were living in Nashville at the time. And then the music city, then the Athens of the South, and then another thing that Nashville was known for was Southern hospitality, right? Um, in, in looking at and listening to the voices that we engaged for this work and allowing them to tell their stories, we had to rethink what it meant to be in its city in a place that had um, pockets of deep, deep poverty, or what it meant to be in its city in places and, and, and have a place where um, workers were having their wages stolen. Or even the music city, you had to think about what type of music was being played. Understanding that um, there's a multitude of people, there were a diverse number of voices in this city that created the symphony that is the music city, right? But oftentimes we did not listen to them. And the Athens of the South, we celebrate the city as being an intellectual and cultural center. Um, but in, in exploring some of the stories in this work, you'll find that we privilege some cultures over others. And then Southern hospitality. Um, we'll find that there's a, a, a conflict that we have to deal with even attempting to 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 apply that 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 term to the city so this 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 book as you go through it you'll see that we have divided it up into sections that explore each of these terms and and the voices that resonate in these sections will 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 cause you to rethink to re-interrogate these terms. Another thing to consider about this book, um, you know, the fundamental question that the publishers oftentimes ask you, who's the audience? Who's going to read this? Who is this book for? Most of the time, your typical guidebooks are written for outsiders. Um, but I humbly submit to you that this work is as much for long-term Nashvilleans as it is for newer residents or visitors. And I'm starting to think now that the, the latter, um, the newer the new residents and, and visitors make up the majority of people here in Nashville. So it's a book for everybody. You might find some entries that are a celebration or an affirmation of your community's resilience, their creativity, and their strength. And, and in this book, we've put to paper stories that have been a part of your community's oral, oral histories. That is stuff that you might hear in the barbershop or the beauty salon or in the restaurant that isn't never really made it to um, to the printed word. So we, we, we are grateful to Vanderbilt University Press for taking a chance on this work and giving voice to residents of the city who have long been ignored or, or overlooked by book publishers. Other entries will offer the chance to learn something new about this place where you live. For those of you who are, that are visiting or relocating to Nashville, engaging this text might be a part of how you orient to the city 
and prepare you to be a good neighbor. It, um, I've been in Nashville now, I moved here in 2009, and there's still parts of the city that I have not visited. And, and I'm almost ashamed to say that, but we get so tied up in going to work and coming back home and, and there's one or two or three restaurants that are favor, a couple of places that I go to listen to music and, and, and that's it. And, and for me, what this book revealed to me that there were certain parts of the city that I was completely missing out on. So in reality, I wasn't really enjoying Nashville. I was just experiencing one or two neighborhoods. I think what is most beneficial about this work is that the, the places that I did not know, that I did not visit, now I have the opportunity to learn about them. But the residents from those communities are telling me about their spaces. They're saying, well, okay, doc, come here and this, it's what you're going to see. And, and by the way, the food is really good over here. Um, I was asked by someone um, last week, which of the stories in this book most resonated with me. And um, there are two that I want to share with you very quickly. Um, for those of y'all that know me, you know I like to get out and walk. Um, for me, it's a form of meditation. When I do it in the mornings, it's, it's like a devotional. So I took a walk last Sunday to, um, I went to the pedestrian bridge. Um, it was a nice day. I got up early and, and, and walked around. And ultimately, I was drawn to the same spot that I'm always drawn to when I come to the, when I, when I walk on the pedestrian bridge. I was drawn to this bench. This bench um, was placed in the memory of um, Tara Cole. Um, she was a young woman who, um, who had some mental health issues and she was under housed. And the thing was, she would oftentimes fall asleep out at Riverfront Park. So one evening, a couple of dudes um, came to Riverfront and saw her asleep on the bench. And they pushed her in the water. They pushed her in the Cumberland. And um, she drowned. They took her, ten, it, it took her, uh, took the authorities 10 days to find her body. Um, this bench is a fitting memorial, I think, in that it um, it commemorates this beautiful soul who was taken from us early, and it it pays um, homage to the homeless, the underhoused in the city. And the bench is right on the waterfront. But it's also, I, I, I thought about how in many ways it was hidden because unless you were really looking for it, you would miss it. So it's a very, very powerful message um, that sits in the middle of the city. And you think about how many people pass through that space um, every single day and it's, it's very easy to miss it. For me, this bench more than anything else represents the some of the narratives that are in this text in that you'll hear voices that have been there, but you might miss it because you're not looking for it. Another um, point place that's really powerful to me is the Estes Kefauver Federal Building. And for me, it what this this space does is it links um, our struggle for social justice in a really powerful way. Um, we talk a lot about the 1960s in Nashville, and rightfully so because it's the 
era of the civil rights movement, you have the Nashville movement. And this is one of the most significant movements in this country. Um, the photograph on the left is a photograph of Stokely Carmichael and H. Rap Brown and George Ware. They're leaving the, the, uh, they're leaving the courthouse. Um, for those of y'all that are familiar with the history, you will remember um, Stokely Carmichael being invited to Vanderbilt to speak, um, but also be aware that he spoke at Fisk and at TSU. When they departed um, Nashville, a riot broke out and they blamed it on, on these gentlemen. Um, seeing them come from this courthouse in this photograph made me think about um, how they were fighting for social justice. They were engaging in an activity that, um, that one can say has been a constant activity in the history of the city. The photograph on the right and, and consider yourselves consider yourselves privileged because I usually don't break this photograph out. It's it's my favorite photo that I've taken since I've I've been here. Um, I, I love this photo, but at the same time, I I hate what I see in it. Um, this photograph was taken in the aftermath of. Um, the murder of Mike Brown in, in Ferguson. And I can remember um, leaving campus and receiving a text from one of my students who said, Dr. Williams, you need to come downtown because we are going to march. So I, I left TSU and uh, made my way there. And I'm um, um, an amateur photographer and I like photographing in public, but I, I I'm kind of reluctant to take pictures of people in public. So I guess I might need to just stick the landscape or something like that. But um, I, I saw this young girl on the right lifting up a sign and I said, okay, I'm gonna get a picture of that because she's holding up a poster board with um, with a, 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 a statement. And um, had a picture, I couldn't really make it out, but it appeared to be a family member in that photograph. So I, I focused on that. But then I, I took a picture. When I took the picture and started paying attention to it, I, I paid attention to the face of the young woman who she was leaning on. And I didn't really see that initially. But I saw that face and I saw a look of pain. I saw a look of a struggle and it, this face emphasized what all of us was feeling because we were really hurting that day. So in a, when I put this presentation together, I saw that struggle for civil rights, for social justice manifest itself in, in, in both these photographs. The, last thing I want to say is that, um, you know, we have over a hundred entries in this, but this text is incomplete. Um, I can honestly say that I've, I, I made a concerted effort to get to as many parts of Nashville as I could in those areas that I couldn't get to, um, Dr. Thurber got to them. So we covered a lot of ground. Nonetheless, there are many, many stories that we are missing. There are many, many people out there who have a story to tell. So what I am going to do right now, since I have your attention, I'm going to invite you all to keep looking for these stories, to share these stories. These are things that might be in the mainstream, but then there are others that people might have overlooked. Um, one of the things that I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to about the civil rights movement until I got to Nashville, I didn't really think about where 
they got the money for um to to bail a lot of the students out you know the students get sent in 64 they go in 64 and they sit into they sit in Woolworths at the lunch counter they get arrested and 64 more come in um some of the students refused to pay bail but others they wanted to get out so where did they get that money who had that type of money it wasn't until i arrived here in nashville that i had a true appreciation for numbers runners and bookies because they had the cash on hand to bail these people out um they um the folks that you might consider to be insignificant play a prominent role in the history of the city so this could be something as simple as the, the lady at the church who fried chicken and made plates to take to the students that were arrested uh, to make sure they ate um it could be something as simple as um mrs uh, um all my stories are true i don't know why i prefaced them by saying this but i, I was sitting up in the library at an event and um you know i had just arrived in nashville i really didn't know anybody and I, I saw an elderly couple or couple sitting up. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go over there and sit with them. I don't know anybody. And they they look nice. So I was talking to the gent and um he asked me what I did. I said, I'm a professor of history at Tennessee State University. He says, All right, I want to show you something. So he takes off and he goes up in the stacks. Then he comes back down, he opens up a book, and he starts stumbling through the pages and he 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 comes to a photograph. And in that photograph, it has it's John Lewis, Bernard Lafayette, all of the icons of the civil rights movement. Then I see a dude up in the corner of the room with his feet kicked back on the table. And it's him. And I was like, wow, what did you do? And he told me that he carried bail money down to Mississippi to get the, some of the Freedom Riders out. So that there's there's a saying that you should not judge a book by its cover. And I encourage you to to do that when you engage people to talk about the history of Nashville, particularly when it comes to social justice. So in, in closing, I, I, I want to say that this this book was needed and with all humility it was desperately needed because the voices that the city has chosen to marginalize or ignore they needed to have their moment in the sun to tell their stories to reveal their truths thank you thank you so much lee i um really appreciate just the way you framed what is significant about countering the dominant narratives of the city and adding to the historical record of Nashville. I um, want to take a, a few minutes on my uh, end of this talk to talk a little bit more about the process of, of putting this book together. This project really sought to upend notions of who can and should be a legitimate author of play stories. As Lee said at the start, most tour guides are written by people who are seen as experts by virtue of their professional credentials. Perhaps they're historians or established travel writers. Often they're not from the place they're writing about. And we intentionally sought to reorient views of expertise by assuming that community members are the resident experts of Nashville. And we are indebted to the advisory committee, as Lee mentioned, that uh, helped us to really envision this commitment to democratize the telling of play stories and bring, bring that commitment to life by recruiting people to submit entries and by uh, writing up entries yourselves. I have a vivid memory of one of our earliest meetings on campus at Vanderbilt and Mayborn Hall and one of our advisory members, Tristan, saying, once this comes out, I want 100 people in Nashville to be able to pick it up and say, yeah, I helped write that. And that was about seven years ago. And today, more than 100 people can pick it up and see that they helped write it. 
we had to learn a lot along the way as we moved through this process of recruiting entries. Um, one of the things that we had to sort out was what to do when we received multiple entries about the same place. And we hadn't really anticipated that, but on numerous occasions, we got multiple entries about the same site, but written from a di different perspective, highlighting a different piece of history or the, uh, location significance to a different group. One example of this was uh, uh, the entries related to the camps of St. Cloud Hill around Fort Negley. Um, we received an, uh, one of our earliest entries was about the significance or the military significance of Fort Negley as a historical site. It was built as a Union military base during the Civil War. We got a, a second entry submission about the contraband camp that was located on St. Cloud Hill. This is where Black laborers who had come to Nashville as refugees from slavery lived and were conscripted to work building the, the fort uh, in exchange for boarding. And we also received entries about the houseless camps of St. Cloud Hill that um, were present in more recent history and were forcibly closed and that land bulldozed as seen in this picture in 2016. So we had multiple entries about this single site and had to sort of work with the authors to figure out a through line to knit these stories together. Another example of this was around the public square. There were so many stories that people wanted told about the downtown public square in Nashville. Uh, Lee, as a historian, wanted to make sure we included its early history as a site of Saturday slave auctions. Kwame Lillard and others wrote about its significance to the civil rights movement in Nashville. We had a number of local organizers who'd been involved in anti-war protests and the uh, homeless power project uh, movement and Black Lives Matter who wrote about its significance as a site of protest. Uh, but we also received entries about its significance as a site of celebration. Uh, I remember sitting with a LGBT advocate tearing up who was describing being at the Tennessee's first legal same-sex wedding on the stairs of, of, this, uh, of the public square um, and it, as a site of the annual gay pride parade. So again, with author's permission, we work to knit these together. And I think this entry has more authors than anybody else. I think there's eight on this one. This process of receiving entries, editing, synthesizing, really helped us as editors to understand and hopefully convey the complexity of places that hold layered histories and diverse and at times divergent meanings. That a place that some people visit to think about its historic significance, other people are experiencing as a site of present day exclusion. That a place that some people go to protest, other people go to celebrate. And that if we know a place at all, we often know it by its significance to us, our people, our families, our communities, and that there may be other meanings we don't know. For me, this part of the process has been an invitation to keep asking wherever I am, what matters about this place? What has this place meant at different moments and to different people? What are the stories about this place that are publicly remembered? And what are the stories of this place that are purposefully forgotten? Another important part of this process of collecting entries was working with folks who I would describe as eager collaborators but reticent writers. So as we started getting the word out about the project, we were met with a lot of enthusiasm. People had no shortage of ideas of places that ought to be in the book, of stories that ought to be told. But we soon realized that not everybody sees themselves as a writer. And some people wanted help in documenting their stories. As an educator, one of the most rewarding parts of this project for me was figuring out ways to engage students in partnering with these uh, reticent writers to contribute their, their play stories. Um, and in many ways, the engine for collecting entries on this, uh, for this book became a graduate course in Vanderbilt's Community Development and Action Program. I'm so grateful to Sarah Suter, the program director, for believing in this project and integrating it so fully into this course over three years and giving me the opportunity to co-teach the class for two of those years. This is an image of the students from the first cohort that worked on the project and a, a number of them are on, on this call tonight. Uh, it was truly a, an honor to work with these students and those that came after. I was very excited to figure out ways to integrate the project into the class. Um, but also cautious and a little bit worried given our commitments 
to really reorient views of expertise. And we didn't want this to turn into another version of academics speaking for or on behalf of the community. I think on the, the, there's sometimes a false binary that we set up between campus and community where we assume that uh, academics are somehow separate from community. And we know that's not the case. Um, many of our academic colleagues and students are intimately connected to, to Nashville. I think of Linda Wynn, who's one of our contributors to this book, who's an assistant director with the Tennessee Historical Commission on, on faculty at Fisk University. And she's also a graduate of Pearl High School. And her entry on Pearl High is a reflection of both her lived experience and her scholarship. So there can be a false sort of binary between campus and community. But on the other hand, as I was thinking about my Vanderbilt graduate students, I knew that many of them were brand new to Nashville. They don't have a lot lasting ties here. Um, and they're as grad students being socialized to see themselves as experts, to see themselves as developing or acquiring technical skills. And that we often do a better job preparing graduate students to partner with other field experts to solve problems than we do to look for the expertise that's already living within communities. So we designed this project that would in, invite students to partner with community members over the course of a semester to collaborative really research and write entries for the guide. And we offered a, a fair amount of scaffolding and support within the class for this project, but students had to work independently to, um, to outreach, to um, reach out to prospective community partners with a focus on communities whose stories are often not, um, not visible or perhaps ignored in Nashville. They were, students were expected to build relationships. This was, I think, the hardest part for many of them to like start from scratch and cold call people to show up at meetings, show up at events, start getting to know people. And then um, as they built relationships, invite people to participate in the project, let them know about this book, uh, let them know that we're soliciting entries, see if they were interested in being involved. And, and if they were, think with uh, their, the community partner about what sites might, might need to be um, considered. And then learn, learn about the place, go on tours, um, spend time in the archives, spend time talking to their community partners, lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations, and then engage together in the process of writing. In some cases, the community member was excited to take the lead and the students played more of a background role researching and editing. In other student cases, the reverse occurred and the students took the lead on writing and the, their partner edited. And there were some of our students who taught their community partners how to use Google Docs and they had a shared workspace for writing and editing together. And over the course of those uh, three years the, that this course involved 54 students and 42 community partners. And these are community organizers, neighborhood leaders, small business owners, folks who shared their histories of Nashville in their own words that might not otherwise be documented were it not for this project. And together, these students and their partners contributed 40% of the entries for this book. So um, it really was the, a, 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 such a significant part of the creation of this book. Some of the entries that they contributed include the site of a former bridge crossing along the Trail of Tears in downtown Nashville that was co-authored by an indigenous historian. Significance of First Baptist Church, Capitol Hill to Nashville civil rights movement co-authored by a local labor organizer and longtime member of the church. The former state penitentiary, co-authored by a former inmate there who's still incarcerated, serving a life sentence. And the site of immigrant rights protests in Nashville, co-authored by youth organizers. While these entries themselves were incredibly powerful, I was particularly struck by the learning that came through this process of building relationships and writing together. One of my students, Joseph, is a child of immigrants, is from the Philippines, grew up in California and moved to Nashville for grad school. And he shared this reflection in class. He said, I had a lot of ideas when I heard about this project, but as I learned more, I felt there were two questions I had to answer. What is Nashville to me? What am I to Nashville? So with this mindset of being a part of Nashville's Asian community, I decided to learn more about it. And he went on to explore three sites of significance to Nashville's Asian community. Another student, Hannah, documented important places to Nashville's LGBTQ community over time. 
also new to Nashville, she wrote, as a queer woman in a very new place, learning more about the queer community where I live is important to me. To understand more about the context in which I'm living makes me feel safer and more at home. I also believe it makes me more involved and aware community member. This relationship was really striking to me between learning more about a place and feeling more connected and safe and belonging and wanting to be more civically involved. And as it happens, both these students and many others stayed in Nashville. Hannah works for the Homeless Impact Division for the city and Joseph is now the executive director of API Middle Tennessee. While we certainly don't take credit for the good work that our students have gone on to do, they did talk with us along the way about the difference this project made for them. And they, they described how being a part of the project powerfully reoriented their view of expertise, that they shifted from seeing the community as a site of problems to be solved to seeing the community as a source of energy and insight to meet the problems we collectively face. And as they learned more from their community members, they saw themselves as more deeply connected with and committed to their neighbors. And this was our hope for this, these future practitioners and including them in this project, but also for this book as a whole. I, I want to say that I too was new to, as a student to this process. I moved to Nashville in 2013 and was new to the city. I was new to Tennessee. I was new to the South. I always knew I would return home to Portland, Oregon, which is where I'm from and the communities that have raised me. Um, but I also knew I wanted to learn more about the place I'd landed. And I wanted to not, not only extract from Nashville while I was there, but to hopefully contribute something of value. And I was thrilled to be part of this project from the beginning, but also grappled with what role made sense for me as an outsider, as a short timer, and more personally, as someone who had moved my white family into one of Nashville's historically black gentrifying East Nashville neighborhoods. For me, this process was an invitation to keep asking, what do I need to learn here? And how can I learn it? Where are there existing resources and sources of wisdom? And also, what can I offer here? And what help would be most helpful? While I'm listed on the book as an editor, and I certainly did a lot of editing along with Lee, I feel like something more of like a, a midwife or doula feels like a more accurate description. The stories in this book were already here in Nashville, and I saw my job as helping them get written. I provided encouragement, coaching. I let folks know what to expect in the process, sometimes brought snacks. Like many of my students, I sat with people on the phone or in person as they described places that were important to them and helped them figure out how to write up those stories. And time and again, I heard from so many contributors how much it mattered that they got to birth their own play stories, that they got to author these stories under their own names, that they can be part of the more than 100 people who can pick up the book and say, I helped write that. Ultimately, this process of reorienting views of expertise wasn't about turning away from credentialed scholars. And we're so honored that we have so many of our colleagues from Fisk and TSU and American Baptist College and Vanderbilt, among others who submitted entries that are in this book. But it was about turning toward the lay leaders, the neighborhood historians, the activist archivists, who are the resident experts of Nashville's struggles for social justice. And in learning from these resident experts, we hope that the book's readers, much like our student collaborators and ourselves as editors, will also feel yourselves more connected to and committed to your neighbors in Nashville. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Lee for some closing remarks. Thank you, Ami. Um, I wanna close with some appreciations. Um, first and foremost, to those who contributed stories, images, archival collections, and maps to this book, we, we thank you. Um, in the course of collecting and editing these stories, um, several contributing author, authors were laid to rest, underscoring to us the urgency of this project. Um, we dedicated this book to Kwame Lillard, who recently passed away. Um, um, this, this book 
is special because it includes republi a republished essay of his, and he contributed six entries and a number of personal reflections that are interwoven throughout the book. Um, Kwame's spirit resides in every single entry in that um, they, like him, um, fought for social justice, were tireless in the effort to obtain social justice. And um, with Kwame Lillard, you knew that if you had him on your side, um, you know, you might not win that particular day, but you certainly were not going to lose. Um, the entries in this book inspire me in the same way. And we also want to acknowledge others who died before this book was published. Um, George, Dr. George Smith, um, a, a dear friend of mine, who's a physician down in Murfreesboro. He's one of the founders of the 13th U.S. Colored Troops Living History Association. This is a group of reenactors. Um, Dr. Smith contributed the entry on the U.S. Colored Troop Memorial. Um, Dr. Smith, as the photograph shows, and I can't help but smile, he, um, he's one of those people that you run into and as soon as you saw his face, you didn't know what was going to happen next, but whatever it was, you knew it was going to be good. So we are honored to have his name in the text. And then we have Patty Mint, a longtime owner and operator of the International Market and Restaurant. And she was also a leader in the Buddhist community. She contributed two entries. And also, last but not least, the advisory member, Dr. Revis Mitchell, Jr. Um, Dr. Mitchell was a Nashville historian, a Fisk faculty member, and that's just a few of his titles, but I think one of the most important roles that he played with this book was he was an advisor and a reviewer for this project. And we'd also like to say that um, coordinating and completing this project would not have been possible without the dedicated work of student research assistants um, who solicited and co-authored entries, who conducted archival research, who maintained a public presence for the project, and who created systems to manage and track all of the entries. I am especially grateful for that last part. We also appreciate the contributions of all who reviewed the manuscript, those who contributed financial support and to our home institutions. We are particularly grateful to Vanderbilt University's College of Education, which was truly a champion for this project. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think we have a few minutes reserved for questions and discussion. We will turn it back. Yes. Over to you. Thank you both so much for for sharing these stories and uplifting the uh, the voices of community members across Nashville. And I know you have many people here who have been part of the book club, uh, book and putting that together. Um, I I would turn it over to you and please feel free to kind of. Um, uh, Turn on your videos and join the discussion. And um, I, I would welcome any thoughts or comments that you guys have. It does look like the books arrived for the printer today. So that's exciting <laughs> news hey. that we will get those soon. I'll jump in just to say congratulations to Ami and Lee and what a wonderful job you did. And, uh, you know, I was just a very small part of one story and I loved participating and it was a great process. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Glad that you're 
an author. <laughs> uh, I wanted to mention that the uh, Nashville Department of Parks is taking um, comments on whether people would like to see Hadley Park renamed for Kwame Lillard. And I've already commented that it's an excellent idea. Apparently, uh, the original name of it is a perhaps a slave owning plantation owner. So I think that, and, and Kwame was someone who took us there around this neighborhood. Kwame actually was a person who would take you there <laughs> to show you what happened in this neighborhood, particularly during the 1960 uh, civil rights movement. We do have a question um, for you. Um, are there any plans for part two, given how many entries you received from the book? And kind of some of the comments that you guys made as well about additional stories. You know, one of the um, sister projects of this um, of this is something, uh, uh, an effort that's happening nas nationally, this People's Guide kind of effort. And there's uh, an online version of this where the idea is that people can submit entries about places um, of significance. And I don't actually know if that online platform is fully operationalized yet, um, but I think that would be a great way for it to continue living. It's almost, it, it, as we were writing it, things were getting were outdated. <laughs> um, there are places that are changing. There's new stories to tell about places that, um, so it, we do need to have a living archive of uh, where we can, can keep contributing these stories about places that aren't in the book, but also about the new, in iterations of places that are already there, but new stories that need to be told. I think it would be wonderful if you had an interactive web page where people could tell their personal stories or connections, and it really would become a living history that continually evolves. Uh, I wonder if we could think of a way to, to make that possible. That it just seems to me that that would just make it so much more fun to not only read it, but then see people's connections and how they react to it emotionally and, and, new, and new stories and associations with that place. So it continues to build. And I think too, to flesh out some of the stories that we have in the book, um, we had a really tight word count for each of the entries and that was one of the most difficult things about editing it trying to um maybe cut off a part that was thought was really interesting but didn't quite fit this particular thing that we were doing because we we defined it as sites of social justice but more things in social justice happen in these places um I would like to see one done on, and those of y'all that know me are gonna laugh, you know, the restaurants in Nashville, the food, um, food spots in Nashville. Um, my friend Rachel Martin just did a book on hot chicken and it's a great book and if she's out with it, thank you for that, Rachel. But um, um, spots where people eat in the city, something like that, people's, maybe um, a guide to restaurants. Um, um, for those of us that are uncivilized and just eat everything that we put in front of us, or for those, one for people that are more enlightened, so the, the vegan family out there, something along those lines. I also do want to mention um, that Ami and Lee are going to join us next Wednesday from noon to one for a book club discussion. Um, so we can kind of continue this conversation hopefully there as well. So we would love for you to participate if you're able. Um, and the RSVP is in the chat. So um, we'd also love to hear kind of any thoughts you have or feedback you have about this, this talk. Um, that's also in the chat. So. Um, I know we're just a little bit over time and I wanna say thank you to um, Ami and Lee for joining us here today, for sharing these stories, for putting the, I mean, ha having the <laughs> drive to put it through together. And so thank you both. 
Um, and thank you all for joining us and for all of the contributors who are here today as well. Um, we are so appreciative um, of all of you. Um, and thank you. Yeah. <laughs>